Whenever ancient authors like Matthew and Luke describe the birth and childhood of a hero or famous person, where would they go to research and gather data? Would they interview the parents and relatives of the hero? Or his childhood friends who knew him? No. In fact, these ancient authors performed no journalistic investigations like we'd imagine. They didn't need to. You see, all ancient authors needed was an image of the adult hero's status and roles. That, and a few factual details, is everything Matthew and Luke would need to construct an account of Jesus' infancy and childhood. This was because such stories were always based on what the hero became as an adult. Now wait a minute, how is that possible? How could you write a biographical story about somebody's infancy and childhood if you don't first confirm your reliable sources and get the facts? That's just it. Matthew chapter 1 and 2 and Luke chapter 1 and 2 are not biographies, folks. Ancient authors were convinced that human personality never changed throughout life. Therefore, to Matthew and Luke, a child was an adult in miniature. Stop thinking of the evangelists as Western authors. Mindful of a child's psychological makeup and development. Passing through various stages accepted by modern scientific research. They never even considered or imagined anything of that sort. In the cultural world of Jesus, the transition from child to adult was social, not psychological. Thus, when one entered the world of adults, adulthood began. Hence, Mediterranean boys become men when they enter the brutal Mediterranean world of men. Mediterranean girls become women at the wedding transfer happening just before or at Monarchy. Note the social nature to these movements. Boys out from the world of women into the harsh male world. Girls out from their father's home into the patriarchal compound of her husband's father. Again, these transitions are social, not psychological. Jesus, although first appearing to everyone as a poor Mediterranean nothing person, a Galilean nothing person, turned out to be a great hero. In other words, he died and became famous. When you die and are risen by God as Messiah, soon to return to inaugurate theocracy from Sky Vault, well, that makes you great and famous. The only way an ancient person received a childhood account was if he died and became famous. Otherwise, you wouldn't get one, folks. The Mediterranean cultural world of the Gospels is a world of stereotypes. If you see one Pharisee, you've seen them all. If you see one Nazarene, you've seen them all, and you know that nothing good comes from Nazareth. The evangelists experience the reality of the risen Lord regularly and routinely in what cognitive neuroscience and anthropologists term altered states of consciousness. They deeply experienced that Jesus had been raised by God indeed, and therefore was great indeed. Therefore they were understandably too embarrassed of Jesus' Galilean origins in nothing place Nazareth not to mention his mother's shameful early pregnancy, to invent these facts. To write an account of a great person's childhood required no research. No interviewing parents, no interviewing the people in the village of origin, or his childhood friends and acquaintances. Almost all of the information Matthew and Luke needed for this task could be solidly inferred from Jesus' adult behavior. Because everyone knew that a great adult must also have been great in miniature as a child. Whatever great characteristics the hero had as an adult simply must have been there from birth. They would have remained constant throughout the Great One's heroic life at all points. This is how ancient Mediterraneans perceived, understood, and communicated reality. The unknown anonymous evangelists we call Matthew and Luke were no different. Was the hero, Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah, soon to come from God with power? 
Matthew, Luke, and their audiences would unhesitatingly affirm this. If this significance and greatness was true of the adult Jesus, well, then it must also have been just as true of the infant Jesus. Consequently, since this was so of the risen Jesus, it was quite obvious that his birth and childhood had to be exactly like Matthew and Luke described it. Never mind that both accounts disagree on so many things and irreconcilably contradict each other. Consider all the persons surrounding Jesus at his birth and throughout his childhood in both infancy narratives. Anything said about these people isn't a photograph of how these people actually historically were. These details are included to highlight Jesus as a great one and a hero. These were not provided to flesh out biographically Jesus' relations. Consequently, instead of imagining the infancy narratives as fact-precise biographies, see them as preflections of Jesus, risen Messiah and cosmic Lord. Wasn't it expected that in the last days before God established Israelite theocracy, the kingdom of God, that young men shall see visions and old men shall dream dreams, as Joel chapter 3 verse 1 said? Therefore, Matthew features an old man dreaming dreams. No, he doesn't tell us that Joseph is old, but his readers could infer that he must have been old, given his dreaming. However, Luke must clarify that Zechariah is an old man, because otherwise his audience would imagine him young due to his visions. Note how Matthew and Luke write their infancy narratives according to Mediterranean cultural expectations. So, when God communicates with women, the exchange is limited to female reproductive functions and gender-based roles, like Luke chapter 1, verse 26 through 38. Ladies and gentlemen, an inspired Mediterranean man remains still a Mediterranean man. Folks, these accounts, like the rest of the Gospels and really the whole Bible, were not written for, by, or about 21st century North Americans or Northern Europeans. Therefore, they completely lack our interests and sensibilities and our obsession with facticity. If we are going to taste their good news this Christmas, the first step is reading them respectful of their culture. Last time we learned that to write an account of a great Mediterranean person's childhood required no research, no fact-checking, and no reliable sources in the modern sense. Thus, the evangelists we name Matthew and Luke wouldn't have needed to interview Jesus' parents, or home village, or childhood friends and acquaintances. We discussed how, according to scholars Bruce Molina and Richard Rohrbaugh, almost all the information gospel writers needed for this task could be solidly inferred from Jesus' adult behavior. This was because they, like every ancient person, knew that a great adult must have been great in miniature as a child. So to answer the riddle, how did Matthew and Luke discover the baby Jesus? Is understanding how they explored regularly and routinely the adult risen Jesus appearing in visions before them in the Jesus group. Being inspired by God does not transform ancient Mediterranean scribes into 21st century idealized American news reporters. The most important part of the word inspiration is the prefix in. Inspiration happens in, in history, and in a cultural setting. Imagine that you were an author living long ago in the Mediterranean world. You belong to a culture that has no awareness of human psychological development from children growing to adults. Additionally, you were socialized to believe that children were adults in miniature. And so if you knew of a great heroic adult, whatever heroic or great qualities he had as an adult must have also been present in the same person when he was a child. Now imagine you wrote an account of the hero's infancy and childhood. Why would you need to suddenly morph into a 21st century American journalist or biographer in order to accomplish your task? If you are an ancient Mediterranean storyteller, about 95-99% to 99 of the information you need will be provided by your image of the adult hero. Then, trained in the art of ancient Mediterranean rhetoric, you will craft an honorable childhood account that mirrors the hero as you know and interpret him in his adult form. If you are a late first century Jesus group author writing about Jesus' childhood, about 5 to 1% of your data will come from embarrassing stuff. 
This would be material passed down through the Jesus group and from its enemies, stuff neither yourself nor the Jesus tradition would ever invent. Examples would be like his lowly village peasant status, or that Jesus was a starving artisan and day laborer, or the embarrassing fact that he comes from Nazareth in Galilee, nothing place of nothing people. Remember how in the fourth gospel that Nathaniel recalls that nothing good comes from Nazareth? Why would gospel authors invent scandals like those? Answer, they wouldn't. None of it squared with the great hero appearing before them in visions, the Messiah and cosmic Lord, soon to return from Sky Vault with power to establish theocracy in the land of Israel. But both insiders and outsiders to the Jesus groups remembered that Jesus was called Jesus of Nazareth. The authors of the Gospels couldn't dodge that embarrassment or the other scandals remembered. They were forced to face these facts, and they did so creatively. But their creative responses were not the stuff of bullshit artists or used car salespeople. They were honestly grappling with how the risen Lord they experienced as risen could possibly have come from such shameful lowly origins. So they wrote truth from truth, folks. Factual truths, remember, are only one type of truth. Truth is a much wider circle encompassing factual truths. So, Jesus' mother being shamefully pregnant before living with her husband? Paul never talks about this. After Paul, the earliest gospel, Mark, completely omits any infancy stories. If he knew what Matthew and Luke describe about the wondrous birth of Jesus, how could Mark possibly have left that out? But like later evangelists, the anonymous scribe we call Mark nevertheless heard the slander of the gossip network. Some people consider Jesus to be a bastard. Note the culturally unusual expression, Son of Mary, in Mark chapter 6, verse 3. That isn't how you identify somebody in the biblical world. It's the Son of the Father, not the Son of the Mother. Unless you don't know who the Father is. You're not sure who the Father is. Then you might say, Son of Mary. See? Mark, writing around 70 Common Era and no earlier than 65 Common Era, refers to Jesus the tecton, or artisan. But he never mentions any human father. And other than Joseph of Arimathea, names no other character Joseph. According to Context Group scholar Andres Van Aard, from 70 till 135 Common Era, controversies about peasant Jesus' illegitimacy raged between the Jesus groups and their fellow Israelites outside the Jesus groups. At this time, we learn about Joseph. Writing in the 80s, Matthew tells of Joseph's righteousness and his Davidic honor. Matthew draws heavily from the Joseph we find in the book of Genesis. Matthew's Joseph, therefore, also has prophetic dreams. He is described as a hero taking a holy marriage with an impure wife. Aided by God, this Joseph saves his family by taking them into Egypt. Now Luke writes after Matthew, and he's oblivious to many of the details Matthew includes, like the Holy Family ever going into Egypt, or King Herod and his plot to murder newborns. Luke doesn't mention any of that. He instead reports Joseph taking his family on a journey to the temple in Jerusalem. No document written before 70 Common Era mentions Joseph. After the second century, literature augments this figure, sometimes into the bizarre. How much of these so-called facts about Joseph correspond with the historical situation of Jesus? Did any human father play a role in the life of the historical Jesus? Writing about great Mediterranean heroes, whatever outstanding characteristics he enjoyed as an adult simply must have been there from birth. They would have remained constant throughout his entire life. That is how ancient Mediterraneans perceived, understood, and communicated human maturation. The unknown anonymous evangelists we call Matthew and Luke were no different. Early Jesus groups believed that the hero Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah, 
and Cosmic Lord, soon to come from God with power. Since they recognized this tremendous significance in the adult Jesus, they realized that it must also have belonged to the infant Jesus. Consequently, it was evident to the Jesus groups that the birth and childhood of this hero had to be exactly like Matthew and Luke described it. So Matthew chapter 1 and 2 and Luke chapter 1 and 2, even though they have major biographical disagreements and contradict each other, are nevertheless both true. They bring out the truth of Jesus.
St. Joseph is highly misunderstood by many Catholics and other Christians. How can we see Joseph better, meaning in an historically and culturally plausible way? I challenge you to take the following quiz on Joseph. It will help you better understand him, Jesus, and the Gospels. 1. Before Joseph lived with Mary, what was their probable relationship? A. Childhood sweethearts. B. Best friends. C. Both A and B. D. Patrilateral first cousins. 2. When did Joseph and Mary get engaged? A. Following a great amount of prayer. B. After Mary had spent much time in the temple. C. They never were engaged. D. After they fell in love. 3. Which of the following best describes the union of Mary and Joseph? A. A religious union called marriage. B. A civil union called marriage. C. A covenant by which a man and woman establish between themselves a partnership of the whole of life and which is ordered by its nature to the good of the spouses and the procreation and education of offspring. D. The union or the pooling of honor of two Middle Eastern families whereby the two spouses represent the kinship groups. 4. In biblical marriage, God's will means A. That the spouses, a man and a woman, freely choose not under constraint. B. That the consent between the spouses is an indispensable element that makes the marriage. C. Both A and B. D. That the fathers and mothers of bride and groom do the choosing. 5. When, according to the Matthean infancy narrative, Joseph discovers that Mary is pregnant, initially he is A. Overwhelmed and feels unworthy to play a role with the Holy Mother and Holy Child. B. Humiliated as a cuckold, probably the last person in the village to find out about Mary's pregnancy. C. Grateful to the God of Israel. D. None of the above. 6. Who were the first villagers to discover Mary's pregnancy? A. The women, who are the intelligentsia of the Middle Eastern village. B. Joseph, when the angel of the Lord told him. C. Mary's best friend, Joanna. D. Mary's dad, Joachim. 7. How did people find out that Mary was pregnant before living with Joseph? A. The angel of the Lord told them. B. They just knew it had to be a miracle. C. Either when Mary didn't show up at the only village bath at the time each month when the women gathered to cleanse, or when she did show up, tried to hide it but couldn't. D. When Mary went around the village with a tambourine, singing praises to God because she was pregnant. 8. Matthew informs his readers that Joseph was a righteous man. This means that he a. Was a morally upstanding person. B. Was an Israelite holy man, what anthropologists would call a shaman, someone who can talk with spirits in alternate reality. C. Hardly ever did anything to be guilty about. D. Someone who prayed a lot. 9. Righteous men like Joseph always want to please God. In Matthew, when Joseph learns of Mary's pregnancy, he does not want to accept the child because a. Joseph knows that the child cannot be his, and to accept the child would therefore make Joseph a thief, something that would displease God. B. He feels radically unworthy before the Holy Mother and Holy Child. C. He feels confused and betrayed. D. None of the above. 10. Because in Matthew, Joseph knows that Mary is pregnant already, that means A. God must have done this. B. The devil must have done this. C. Some other human male must have done this. D. There is no way to consummate the marriage, and therefore no way to show the blood-stained sheet to the village at the wedding feast. This will lead to shame and death. 11. How do Mediterranean people like Joseph solve seemingly impossible dilemmas and crises? A. Just like Americans do, with intelligence and hard work. B. Getting advice from family members and friends. C. Through an alternate state of consciousness experience. D. By talking with a priest. 12. When Joseph took Mary into his house, that means that 
A. They lied to everyone at the wedding celebration by faking the bloodstained sheet. B. They told everyone that it's okay that Mary was pregnant early because it was God's will. C. They eloped, skipped town, and hid out in a nearby village until things blew over. D. They paid off everyone to keep their mouths shut. 13. How do you imagine Joseph acting as father to Jesus? A. Joseph was a warm and kind-hearted daddy. B. A hard-working but quiet provider for Mary and Jesus. C. Both A and B. D. Like a Middle Eastern North African father, someone mostly absent from a boy's early life. 14. Thinking about Joseph and Mary, what is the strongest emotional bond among Middle Eastern personalities? A. Between mother and firstborn son. B. Between husband and wife. C. Between brothers. D. Between masters and slaves. 15. And what is the weakest emotional bond among Middle Eastern personalities? A. Between mother and firstborn son. B. Between husband and wife. C. Between brothers. D. Between masters and slaves. 16. How do you think Mary would have fared in Joseph's father's home, the patriarchal compound? A. Always suspect and never truly fitting in. B. Loved and cherished as one of the family. C. Reverenced as the Holy Mother of God. D. They didn't live with Joseph's father. The Holy Family was a nuclear family, just like Americans imagine. 17. In the biblical or Mediterranean world, all women in the patriarchal compound do what to their prepubescent sons? A. Teach them to read the Bible and pray. B. Let them play wherever they want. C. Treat them equally with the village girls. D. Spoil them rotten, doting on them and keeping them pampered, pleasured, embraced, and drowned in warmth. 18. Because of their fiercely gender-divided world, with father and all male role models absent, when men of prepubescent males like Jesus grow up, they necessarily are haunted their entire lives by a. A longing for their fathers. B. A sense of deep compassion given them by their mothers and sisters. C. Gender ambiguity. D. A deeper commitment to religion. 19. Because they are forever haunted by the correct answer to the last question, Middle Eastern North African males compensate for this by means of a. Constantly proving their manhood through Middle Eastern North African hyper-ethnomasculinity. B. Trusting in God. C. Listening to the advice mother gives. D. None of the above. 20. Depending on how long he lived past Jesus' puberty, how would Joseph have probably raised the teenage Jesus? A. With deep prayer and teaching him to be a carpenter by trade. B. Like any great daddy would. C. Both A and B. D. By severe physical beatings, conditioning Jesus to withstand any punishment without complaining. 21. Say as an American Christian, I treat the Bible like a manual on how to raise sons or daughters in our American setting. I follow it closely and act out its prescriptions. What probably will be the result? A. Psychopathology and prison time. B. Holy children who fear the Lord. C. The salvation of America. D. Both B and C. 22. What was Joseph's profession? A. Carpenter. B. Teacher. C. Peasant village artisan. D. None of the above. 23. Given Joseph's work, he and his family were a. Middle class. B. Wealthy. C. Poor. D. Extremely poor. 24. Joseph had to travel to find work. This meant he was viewed by others as A. A righteous man who works hard for his family. B. A social deviant. C. Someone famous throughout Galilee. D. Someone with connections. Well, that's it. 
How do you think you did? To find out, look below in the description for a link to a Pathios blog to find the right answers and gauge how well you know Jesus, Mary, and Joseph as they are presented in the Gospels. Enjoy! It's that time again. No, I'm not referring to the time for getting upset discussing politics with relatives over dinner. And I don't mean the time to stuff yourself to the gills, to prepare to love people by getting into a war early morning. The next day, purchasing plastic goods. I mean that time when the enlightened ones among Christianity troll social media to inform blind people like me that Christmas is pagan. Did you know that Christmas is a pagan holiday? Did you know that Christians shouldn't celebrate Christmas because it's pagan? And so on. Yesterday one of these posts snared my eye on Facebook, Internet Island of Misfit Toys. With this header, why are Christians still putting up Christmas trees? What followed was the routine drivel about how we Christmassy Christians betray Jesus, thereby placing our eternal salvation into jeopardy by pandering to the pagan gods such as Kris Kringle, Frosty the Snowman, and Diabolical Reindeer Rudolph. Receiving this dire warning, I wondered, do these killjoys know how inconsistent they are? I mean, many of them are married, and a lot of those people have wedding rings. And had veils at their weddings. Traditional dress. Traditional, but not to Jesus. To other peoples, outside of the fold of the disciples of Jesus, all our wedding traditions could be called pagan. For that matter, why do Christians learn astronomy and math? In the time of Jesus, astronomy and mathematics, as well as the dread astrology, were one and the same thing. There really wasn't much difference between solving a geometry problem and giving a horoscope. In fact, our Bible finishes with a great example of this, the book of Revelation, which is an astronomic report, astrology all over the place, and a book of numbers. It's a report full of gods, Mediterranean sky entities other than Yahweh. By the logic of these anti-pagan Christians, why do they persist in calling the book of Revelation sacred scripture? The stupidity can grow absurdly with this sort of thinking. Why do Christians sing, dance, and party at their worship services? After all, pagans did that wildly as they persecuted Christians, having them burned to death in colosseums or fed to wild beasts. Whenever a Christian anti-pagan approaches me with his or her Christmas bashing, I always ask them what day it is, and it never fails. They always respond by telling me the day of the week. For instance, Wednesday. And then I'll ask them, and so yesterday was Tuesday, right? And they'll affirm that. Then I ask, tomorrow will be Thursday, correct? Of course, they invariably say. They go to pieces when I then greet them as a fellow pagan. Today, Wednesday, is the day of Woda, Odin. So swiftly the All-Father rides the Bifrost on Sleipnir, his eight-legged stallion. It is so sensible for him to be associated with Vodnesberg, or Wednesday, for after this hump day, the rest of the week follows quickly. Once one of these Christmas killjoys, a Latin American, stopped me at that point, informing me that he doesn't call this day Wednesday, but rather Miércoles, to which I promptly commended him for honoring Hermes, or Mercury the swift messenger god of Mediterranean peoples. He was following his Latin pagan roots by each week honoring Mercury with the day of Mercury. Talk about inconsistency. These people get so upset, so hung up with Christmas being held once per year, but they don't bat an eye about at least 52 weekly celebrations annually of the god of the sun, Sunandaig, Sunday, or the moon goddess, Monandeg, Lunis, Moon Day, Monday, the day of the moon. They reject Christmas Day, but each week honor Mars, or Tyre, or Tew in the Old English, the god of war. T 
Tuesday, or Martes, Tuesday. All you Marvel comics and movie fans should always remember the origin of Thor's day. I mean, Hrunsdag, the day of Thor, Thursday. Or would it be more orthodox, and by orthodox I mean more Mediterranean, to call it Weves, after all things Jovian, as in Jupiter, Zupatar, Zeuspater, Father Zeus Day. This is followed by Friday, or Freya's Day, or Venus's Day, if you call it Viernes, like venereal disease. And then at the end we have Saturn's Day, or Saturday, or Sabado. In ancient Hebrew, the word for the planet Saturn is Shabbatai, from the Babylonian Sukkoth. You'd have to call that pagan too, wouldn't you folks? And what happens when these good Christian people learn that the Bible begins with a Persian-authorized mythic surrejoinder to the Babylonian creation epic Enuma Elish? Genesis 1 couldn't have been written without the Babylonian creation myth first existing. Or what happens when they find out that it was Persian authorized scribes who gave the Israelites their entire Exodus narrative? As well as the Satan, angels, Pharisees, you know, sounds like Farsi, the language they speak in Persia. And resurrection ideas where God turns righteous people into stars. I guess we Christians are pretty screwed since everything Hebrew is already blended with the pagan. Folks, every day is pagan. The whole week comes from different pantheons of pagan gods. Stop placing severe monotheism into the Old and New Testaments. It's rarely encountered in the scriptures. I'm not saying monotheism is untrue, mind you. It just took our ancestors quite a while to arrive at it. New Testament communities were composed of mostly henotheistic Israelites, recognizing God's sky servants while exclusively honoring their patron God, the God of Israel. They knew well of the seven glorious other than human persons, the wanderers, the planets that the days of the week are named after each of them sky gods on the ecliptic pathway in the sky vault. The book called Revelation showcases this celestial stuff. It has many Mediterranean sky entities, otherwise known as gods or angelic beings. It's on every page of the book of Revelation. And we Christians still maintain a ghost of this ancient tradition, birthed in the pagan, filtered by many pagan and polytheistic sky lore traditions. Here are some important things to keep in mind with all this Christmas bashing silliness. The first should be rather obvious, but strangely is elusive to so many Christian dunderheads. Symbols have at least two meanings. So while an apple might mean original sin to one person, it simply means lunch to another. Who's correct? They both are, ladies and gentlemen. You might have heard it said, in the beginning was the word. Okay, but don't believe that. In the beginning was the interpretation. We need to get over ourselves. Symbols are multivalent. No one interpreter owns the patent on what something means. The second thing to understand demands going back over this blog post and substituting the word pagan with another term. Pagan, you see, is a much abused word. There weren't any first century pagans. As it turns out, there weren't any first century Jews or Christians either, but we'll get to that business later on. This was because it wasn't until after Constantine that Christian elites coined the term pagan, labeling it onto any of their fellow Greco-Romans who wouldn't get with the program. When reading the Bible, instead of pagan, use Gentile or non-Israelite. Third thing to keep in mind is that Christians who see evil more pervasive than good in the world are pathetic. 
and their gospel must be false. Not only must it be false, it must be called out as such. It is tragic when Catholics approach things with a fundamentalist condemning there is absolutely nothing good about it attitude. Such a position is incompatible with the true gospel and ontologically absurd. It is also diametrically opposed to sacramentality, the essentially Catholic principle that sees God in all things. So in sacramentality, the early church saw truth, goodness, and beauty in the Mediterranean and Celtic and Germanic feasts, symbols, and practices. So she baptized them, brought out Christ in them. It turns out that Sol Invictus, the winter solstice feast of the unconquerable sun, S-U-N, is the perfect occasion to celebrate the truly unconquerable light of the world, Christ, the sun, S-O-N. Our calendar we share with the polytheistic and so-called pagans became our catechism. The so-called pagan winter solstice is a fitting time to celebrate Christ's nativity, not just his birthday. Of course Jesus wasn't born on December 25th. Christmas is far more than just happy birthday Jesus. Don't oversimplify it. It's much richer than that. Now with Christmas trees going up and Christians decking the halls, other Christians, with too much time on their hands, want to get morally superior and talk about how Christmas sucks. Folks, 2020 has been a long, trying year. Frankly, it has been a brutal year. We have to ask ourselves, how are we healing people by dumping on human warmth? Now, I admit, there are many things about the way we Western people celebrate Christmas with too much materialism, and that needs to be critically reflected on, challenged, and perhaps transformed in many ways. But people putting up Christmas trees in their house being devil worshippers? Who needs a Christianity that holds that stupidity?